This is Digital Music Trends, episode 132, recorded on the 15th of May 2013. This week on the show, thoughts on a potential Google Music Service pre-IO announcement, iRadio's licensing issues, Slacker and iHeartRadio growing, Global Repertoire Database, Medium 2014 date change, The Great Escape and more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we talk about and pick apart and analyze uh, the main uh, stories in the uh, digital music space. And the DMT is available on a variety of platforms including iTunes, Moss Podcatchers, uh, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, uh, uh, Stitcher, Mixcloud and uh, a bunch more as well. Uh, so this week it's a pleasure to welcome back on the show Darren Hemmings, founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown. So hey Darren, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you. You? Great, uh, all good, thank you, all very, very good. And uh, uh, then we have uh, uh, Stephen O'Reilly uh, joining us back on the show after a few months, uh, and he's a direct director of Topswing UK, and director of international uh, sales at Mobile Roadie, and a manager of the band Red House Glory. So hey Stephen, and great to have you on, how's it going? Hey Andrea, th- it's good to be back, things great. are good. Great, awesome, yeah, and, and I can imagine you're busy, uh, lots yeah, of yeah. stuff going on. And so, uh, well, today we uh, got to start, uh, I guess, with the breaking story of the day, uh, which is uh, uh, the Google I.O., uh, Google Music Services story. So uh, in the past few hours, uh, The Verge broke the news uh, uh, early uh, in the early hours of this morning here in the UK, and then it was uh, subsequently confirmed by the New York Times that Google is about to launch a music subscription service that is tied in with Google Play uh, and that will launch uh, later on today uh, during the mammoth three-hour uh, keynote that Google is about uh, is going gonna, is gonna to give at, uh, as the opening session of Google I.O. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is a fairly new development because, of course, we, we knew that this was in the works, but we didn't know the time frame was quite so uh, fast. And, of course, Google is pretty uh, well known for launching stuff that is not quite fully baked at the I.O. and then seeing it developed uh, through, the, through the coming weeks uh, and, and months after that. Um, and apparently, uh, Warner Music was already signed, uh, but it took uh, a while for Universal Music and Sony to get on board. But they are on board, apparently, and so that gives uh, Google a decent catalog to play with. And the most uh, important and interesting part about the story is that uh, it, it, it's uh, apparently confirmed that, I mean this is all still speculation I guess but it's apparently confirmed that it's going to be uh, a split between uh, the Google Play part of, of the streaming subscription service which is what is going to launch today and then uh, perhaps YouTube in a few months will launch with, with its own subscription service for YouTube which uh, uh, entails uh, different and separate negotiations with the rights holders and so uh, of course you know uh, we're a few hours away from the announcement so all we can uh, talk about today is uh, uh, sort of uh, speculations on, on the different options that Google has uh, but I think it will be actually interesting for the audience to hear sort of our our take on it uh, before the actual official product is announced so uh, first of all uh, Darren w- what do you reckon you know is a, is a split between YouTube and uh, Google Play wise when it comes to music subscriptions and and why would Google want to do that it's certainly curious isn't it I, mean, I think um, it, you know I was reading a piece by Peter Kafka I think earlier where you know he was saying it seems like they're doubling down on this in a rather bizarre manner because rather than bet on a Google Play led service they're kind of doing both which I suppose there's two ways of seeing it you know one is is I guess Peter's view which is that they're you know flipping and flopping a bit in terms of what they want to focus on and they're trying to cover both both sides but equally there's probably a flip side to that which is that it's quite a clever move by providing an access point for both and equally you know revenue streams for both I mean if we Consider that the Google Play streaming music thing will just be kind of a and other streaming music service. Then um, you know that has one particular uh, market appeal, and I would imagine it's you know people like me who currently use RDO and Spotify and things like that. And you know I use the Google Play service to uh, sync my iTunes content up to it, and I actually think it's a really good interface and it works very very well. Um, so if they extend that just to be presumably something that's along similar design lines and uh, is simply a streaming service, then you know I'd be pretty happy with that. That would work quite well for me. Yeah. But I think what that uh, forgets is that there's a massive market of kids particularly who use YouTube. And the way in which they consume and interact with music is on a very different level. And I think within that, you know, monetizing all content on YouTube and maybe ordering it a bit more so that you get whole albums on there and a better way to playlist them and organize them and things like that would work very, very well, you know. And so whilst I think one could be critical and say that they're hedging their bets and they're, they're you know, not, not making a proper decision, I think the flip side of it from where I sit is that they're understanding that 
different people and different demographics consume in different ways. And that actually, when you look at it that way, it could be really quite a smart move. And equally, you know, it's a move where at a time when, you know, Android is certainly rising, I think, in terms of credibility. You know, I switched to a, an Android handset last year and I love it. Um, that seems to be a kind of increasing, you know, story that you're seeing more and more. Um, so within all of that, the timing seems quite right to add a kind of bolt on music element to the Android OS and equally for YouTube to kind of get slightly more whipped into shape to have yeah. ordered content rather than just being a mess of all this stuff anyway. Because let's not forget that at the moment, you know, the reality is that most stuff is all over YouTube anyway. Yeah. And therefore, yeah. you know, the way in which they're trying to order this and monetize it and everything else makes good sense. So certainly if I was you know, among the, you know, the industry label side, the rights holder side, I'd be pretty pleased with how this is shaping up because yeah. it's more players in the market. <laughs> it's a double payout. Yeah, it's more revenue for you and kind of why not, right? Yeah. I mean, they're only, yeah. it's only because they own two platforms that they've got the rights to do this. You know, YouTube, once upon a time, was a totally different company and therefore yeah. if they were launching a music service, I don't think we'd be seeing it in quite the same way. But yeah, I, th I think it can only be a good thing for the industry as a whole at the moment. Yeah, and, uh, and Stephen, uh, it's interesting as well because, uh, of course, uh, uh, Google Play will, will always have a much smaller footprint than YouTube in terms of uh, uh, its reach and its subscriber base, and, and that's true, of course, right now as well. Uh, if you look at the download store uh, uh, versus what YouTube, the, the juggernaut that the YouTube is, do you think that it could also be a way to for Google to soft launch, I guess, a subscription service and really understand what the kinks of, of having that out are uh, before it rolls something out on a much larger scale on, on a on you know the billion or almost billion users a month that are on YouTube? Absolutely, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see the ways in which that they can embed you know these services on not just mobile but on other platforms uh, which is like super important to Google as well you know so like all the you know the new set-top boxes, the new connected televisions you know the fact that you've already got, got it on your phone and then you can easily kind of you know interact with that on different platforms uh, is going to be uh, to their benefit, I think. Yeah. Um, and, Google, you know, because and with the glass as well coming in, into play. It's yeah, and all of the, you know, the, yeah, like, um, and if they can open it up to developers as well to build, like, if you look at some of the interesting things that have been built on the Spotify platform and, and, and on Deezer, um, I think, you know, people can do really cool things uh, in the future with, um, with, what, with, with things that Google are, are working on. Yeah, and you make a really good point actually there because uh, you're talking about uh, developers involvement and of course Google I.O. is a developers conference so the fact that they are planning to launch if, if that actually happens, I mean it could all actually be completely untrue but you know assuming that the sources of, of, of the guys uh, that have written about this which are usually pretty good are, are, are good then you know the, the fact that they're launching at a developers conference is pretty indicative of the fact that they are hoping to get developers involved in, in making stuff with the new service rather than just launching a service and making it live uh, of its own of its own accord so that that could be quite, pretty cool really right yeah and I, like um yeah i i'm really excited to see how developers can kind of can get involved and to build a business on the back of that because it's kind of really important to google as a as a platform to have uh, ways in which developers can monetize uh, on top of uh, on top of Google Play and anything that Google, that you can sell through Google because up until now, uh, especially from my experience, you know, for mobile rodeo over the past three years, is that um, the majority of transactions happen on the iOS and uh, Apple platform. Uh, it's very easy to purchase and transact and buy inside uh, of your uh, iPhone or your iPod or Apple TV and. Google need to make that attractive to developers to continue to uh, um, be appealing and to make money for developers yeah. and any ways in which they can do so will lead to more developers uh, moving away from Android or iOS or being less focused on iOS and working more on Android because of the, the revenues. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it would be interesting actually to see what the kind of uptake of the man in the street will be. I mean, you know, as others have pointed out, there's some insane number of Android handsets out there. Um, so, in theory, there's quite a market to, to funnel down to paying customers. But <clears throat> whether they will is a different matter because, obviously, the Google Play Store sells downloads at the moment, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't really feature in, you know, 
in any labels uh, revenue streams in the top 10 I wouldn't have thought yeah. Yeah. but um, but I do you know I think sometimes Google can be quite clever at doing things that may not necessarily be the sexiest product on the block but which do tend to get quite a pickup and in fact you could probably apply that to a lot of Google products at the moment I mean you know Gmail I always think is not a particularly good looking interface <laughs> it's a bit kind of functional but it's you know probably the the you know the number one or number two email platform now, um, and the reason is that it's pretty powerful. It does a great job, and you know currently obviously it's it's free, but you know in due course you know as they're adding more and more ways in which you can use cloud storage and things, you know the costs around all of it are still really really cheap. So you know coming in with a product that may not be the most sexy on the block, but just kind of bolts in perfectly to your existing handset and comes with that kind of safe Google branding and everything may be more compelling, but th this is the kind of watershed moment, I guess, where we see just how, how much Google's brand can, can swing people when it comes to music. Yeah, yeah and, and it also gives you, gives you a, it's going to give us a perception of how much people associate Android with Google, because, of course, uh, Apple has been very good at uh, striking relationships directly with carriers when it comes to making handsets available across different markets, whilst uh, when it comes to Android, it's more like the the device's own manufacturer that has a relationship with the carrier rather than Google because of course uh, Android is customized for each and every single device and so that's going to be interesting because of course Google doesn't have the same direct access to carriers as Apple and so it probably has a different way of pushing the service if, if, if any at all and it might have to go through the, through the manufacturers of the handsets to uh, push it even though some of the manufacturers actually have competing services like Samsung for example they have a competing service that that uh, would clash with Google's offering. So, so very interesting on that. Well, I think, yeah, you know, sorry, go ahead. Another area, sorry, Stu, was, uh, that I think is really interesting, and I mean, we're kind of watching with a wry smile, is the way in which Google is sort of slowly dominating the iPhone with numerous services and the way in which they're now connecting these up in a web-like way, you know, so that you can now, you know, have a Gmail client that will launch links straight into the Chrome browser on iOS and everything else. And, you know, they've done an excellent, you know, by having such a kind of umbrella service there and a way in which it's funded and everything, they can easily kind of circumvent the whole um, subscription percentage issue that blights a lot of services when they're trying to um, get new subscribers on the iOS platform. So it's kind of interesting, you know, there's been some funny articles recently that are certainly very devil's advocate, but they put a case for, you know, Google slowly making the iPhone an Android phone as well by getting their products and shoehorning them between the Apple hardware and the Apple software. And one could argue whether they will try and do the same with music, where, you know, exactly the same thing will come in by way of a separate client, but will then have, you know, links out so that you can share it with your friends using the Gmail client or look the artist up in the Chrome browser and never technically exit the Google ecosystem while still being on your iOS device. Yeah. So one other thing that I wanted to kind of, you know, just mention as well is, the, you know, even in handsets that are already available, you know, Android handsets, like if you've got, you know, you know the latest version of that OS or the previous version, it's, it's very simple for Google just to surface their, their new app right to the front of your phone, you know, and that will like immediately bring, you know, potentially tens of millions of people that have already got those Android uh, handsets, you know, like right in front of the viewer you know in front of the handset owner it's just an incredible uh way to reach existing people never mind all of the the you know the bundling of stuff with new devices but instantly they can you know like hundreds of millions of people can see that application or their new service which is uh powerful that's great yeah i didn't know that because uh, i haven't i haven't used one uh consistently yet so yeah, uh, yeah i'm gonna have to make the jump at some point well darren is a darren is an android user and i'm sure he'll uh, he'll see the apps that are being promoted at the moment on yeah. on play and and like if you can get your app onto the front of that uh, uh feature it's a guaranteed hundreds of thousands of downloads a day you know almost guaranteed yeah mm. that's great Cool. Well, uh, you know, th this story kind of ties into the, the next story, which is uh, talking about Apple and the fact that the Financial Times reported uh, this week that the company has hit a bit of a, uh, of a roadblock in the negotiations with Warner and Sony uh, for their iRadio service uh, after uh, reportedly signing up uh, Universal uh, a little while ago. And uh, uh, Warner is supposed to be closer to the deal than Sony, which is still a little bit of in the high seas uh, as the deal goes. But the core issue, uh, uh, of course, is, is one on, on revenue. And of course, uh, labels have wanted to get as much from Apple as 
possible. Of course, uh, when a big tech giant like that comes to labels, they they see it as a great opportunity to to increase their revenues. And uh, uh, supposedly, the Financial Times said that uh, sources close to the matter reported that uh, labels have already managed to increase the royalty rate offered by Apple from six cents per hundred tracks streamed to uh, twelve point five per hundred tracks streamed, which is uh, similar to what Pandora pays. Uh, and uh, um, you know, but, but Apple also offers uh, some add-ons to that, so that they offer you know, of course, uh, the opportunity to upsell through the iTunes store. And they are also, I think, offering a, a guarantee uh, base uh, for the labels in case the service doesn't take off as well as they uh, as they think they might. Uh, and so and so this is an interesting tie-in because, of course, uh, uh, iRadio, a very different service from an on-demand service. And uh, it, it, it kind of brings in different elements uh, of, of discovery and, and also a, a potential upsell. And I think this conversation also ties into the Daft Punk uh, pre -stream, uh, album uh, pre-release stream uh, that happened, uh, that's happening right now and, and started yesterday that brought, uh, you know, potentially, you know, tens of millions of, or hundreds of millions of people uh, to the iTunes store to check out the new album by Daft Punk. Uh, and so that sh really shows like the potential of having a streaming service within the iTunes environment that then ties into directly the, the download store. So, uh, of course, the roadblocks are problematic for Apple because, you know, that uh, they probably would like to get a service uh, up and running for the next version of iOS, so probably iOS 7. Uh, and at this point, do the labels have more to lose if MP3s start stalling because you know the service is not getting off the ground or does apple have more to lose if the service doesn't doesn't get off the ground uh steven what, what's your take on that yeah so it's a funny one i think you know uh, people like the fact that it's taken so long is you know kind of because there's so much at stake you know from you know apple and their their downloads of you know, you know tracks and then you know the labels, you know the, the um, you know just the sheer revenues that pass through iTunes and the dependency on that uh, stream of revenue. Um, so I think it's been a real shame. It's taken so long to launch, and in the meantime, other platforms, you know, like Audio and Spotify, have been kind of making interesting inroads into those kind of you know trying to build out those services you know the kind of radio service inside yeah. their existing platforms and again like to come back to some of the other apps that are launching within you know things like shuffler fm as an iphone application or an android app and um i'm not so sure how uh, to me something like iradio is not so important to me as a user um but perhaps to my my mom or my dad or my sister um, they might be interested in more of the discovery kind of stuff. I just think it's a shame that it's taken so long, but I guess there's a lot of vested interest behind the, the delays. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Darren, what's your take? Uh, is, uh, is Apple offering too little or are the labels being greedy or what, what's the real problem here? No, I mean, I think there's a few considerations and certainly some possibilities. I mean, the reality is that, you know, iTunes still drives a massive amount of revenue and, you know, there's a question to which, you know, would iRadio or whatever it's going to be called kind of chip into that by actually distracting people from a conversion to sale? I mean, the beauty of a, a Daft Punk stream on iTunes is that you're right there with a big fat buy button next to it and a very seamless integrated way to then ensure that that lands on your device the minute it's made available. So, um, you know, that whole system they have at present is pretty compelling. I'd say, I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit with, with Steve on this one in that I, I still find the whole discussion around iRadio as a product quite weird, but only because, I don't know if it's market dominant, well, I say market dominance, probably press dominance of sort of Spotify and audio and proper on-demand streaming that makes me sort of look at a radio type model as Pandora and, you know, and, and its ilk and, and just sort of be slightly baffled because I'm the same as Steve and I, I I wouldn't actually run to use it anyway. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but and, and equally, I wonder if there's just a simple thing here where you know, I think it's safe to say that you know Apple built a massive platform with iTunes and certainly will have uh, exerted some you know, uh, pressure and thrown its weight around a little bit with all of that to start uh, telling labels uh, how they should be doing things and stuff like that. Uh, so I wonder if there's a kind of once bitten twice shy degree to this as well, whereby labels would really rather not continue to build Apple's empire. And, you know, it, it certainly even for, from where I sit, which is not as a sort of content owner, you know, um, I still look at what's going on and just kind of think, well, this is great because we're now back to a real kind of market full of stuff going on there in all kinds of different areas. And it's a really 
interesting time and very competitive and and that's only to the music industry's benefit you know i think that's a that's a good thing because if you have that world where there's only really apple on the on the block and they they start to dictate terms to everyone um you know that's not necessarily a very healthy uh sort of system to have running yeah. so yeah i think it would be interesting you know but for me i must admit i think because those kind of web radio models haven't taken off in the uk particularly uh i think people like us tend to look at it and shrug a bit because we yeah. just I, I think the uk is you know rhapsody didn't take off over here um pandora hasn't launched over here it just feels like they're all avoiding this area and you've got to wonder whether it's just because the market is you know people don't care that much yeah. you know we yeah. have a very vibrant radio world in, in in the uk you know we have radio one the bbc all of these things that means that people in the uk are actually pretty fervent radio listeners to traditional radio in the us it's a totally different story where radio is kind of just a whole you know it's way more dead <laughs> in terms of its commercial viability that's allowed then things like pandora and that to come in but over here less so so i think it's it's a funny one you know whether yeah. there's a, a true market need for it but we'll see but i i I think my gut feeling at the moment is probably more that labels are more interested in building uh, a competitive environment and, and that's not really helped by doing deals with Apple. And then I would imagine when Apple come in and have especially uh, competitive terms that they're trying to win, the labels are all sat there thinking, well, no, you're all right. You know, you sell our downloads, we've got Spotify, we've got audio, they're all growing well. Why would we sign this? Yeah, I yeah, know you're right. And I would love to see some market research done in the UK as to uh, whether the the country would be you know a, a good place to launch a streaming service because of course uh, a lot of what I heard in the last few months uh, in regards to why services are not launching here has to do with the, this compulsory license fee which is was set by a tribunal a, a fair few years ago and which is uh, apparently is too high uh, and I remember I, I saw some numbers but I can't remember exactly off, off, the, off the top of my head but apparently it's too high to make the services commercially viable as uh, uh, as internet only radios in fact uh, uh, normal radios that are broadcast over over the internet as well pay a far uh, lower fee than uh, an internet only radio that would be broadcasting in the same way that pandora is for example because it's considered a completely different license uh, and so yeah uh, super interesting to, would be to see here whether there is demand for it and whether it would in any way take off if it was launched uh, and uh, yeah and, and that kind of segues into the next uh, sort of couple of stories which were just uh, another uh, crazy rising number in uh, across all different radio streaming services in the US which is uh, you know we talked about uh, songs are last week reaching 4.7 million active users so a really uh, great rise in their user base this week it's a turn of slacker which turn uh, which gained 6 million users and a hundred thousand paying subscribers in just uh, uh, three months since its uh, relaunch uh, it's re it relaunched in uh, February uh, of this year uh, with a wholly new revamped app. Uh, and also we have uh, uh, iHeartRadio, which announced, uh, announced reaching 30 million users uh, uh, in the US. Uh, and again, you know, a relatively new service that uh, I think only like seven months ago had the 20 million users. So again, uh, a big rise in, in, in on that front. Uh, Pandora, of course, is still doing well. They keep announcing uh, more and more users are listening to the platform for more time. And so it's, it almost seems like a bit of an unlimited market for this in the US at the moment. We haven't really seen anybody uh, hitting a wall quite yet. And uh, and it's just in in insane to think that it's such a huge market over there and that here we haven't really seen any of that, uh, any of that rolling in. Uh, and uh, the, the Slacker uh, model actually was interesting. I just, I just wanted to ask you guys what you thought about it because uh, Slacker has got a free subscription for um, a free you know, a model where it's a bit like Pandora, you can listen to it and, and not pay anything. Then it's got a 3.99 uh, tier where it gets rid of advertising, it adds a few stations like ESPN and ABC, it gets rid of, uh, gets rid of uh, commercial, as I said, yeah, it provides song lyrics and stuff like that. That. And then uh, at a 9.99 uh, per month uh, tier, it actually becomes an on-demand streaming service, uh, like fully fledged. So um, it moves away from just being a purely an internet radio personalized radio service, and then it becomes a fully fledged on-demand service. So do you reckon that that's an interesting model? Just because I I think it's the first I hear of a service just being structured this way that it has direct deals with the labels for on-demand, and but it also does the personalized internet radio service. Uh, um, Darren. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting model. I, I wonder if they're, I mean, I, I would love to know what the kind of numbers are for the people that kind of up, upgrade to the full on-demand because it feels like they occupy different spaces. You know, they're, they're quite different beasts, really, aren't they? You know, I think the 
people that would sign up for a Spotify may not be the people that would sign up for a, a Pandora, for example. Um, but it's interesting to me. I mean, I wonder if the proliferation of these services stateside actually uh, is raising a massive indicative flag about the way in which people genuinely want to consume music. You know, this, it goes back to that sort of notion that, you know, the, the real man in the street probably only buys one album a year. You know, and while there's all the hardcore kind of buying, every, you know, five albums a week type people, the reality is that, you know, the, the lion's share, the 80% of people out there buy one album a year at best. And they're probably the people that would rush to sign up for a radio service because it just pipes the music, you know, and allows them to filter it a little bit more based on their tastes and things yeah. like that. So on paper, I can sort of understand why these things have lifted off. And I wonder if, you know, it is a big sign that, while many services are talking about this kind of battle to fix discovery and all this kind of hoopla, whether people care, you know, whether they just want a, a stream of, of music. I mean, in the same way as in the UK, there's a good reason why people are so stuck to the radio. Okay. It's just, it's easy. It just pipes music to them. They don't have to make choices. They just want some stuff on in the background. It's there. It's easy. Why not engage with it? But if that's correct then it kind of raises a question over how many people would care enough to kind of go from a, a you know a, a radio type model to an on-demand one because i just find that a bit bit weird like they're two different products you know so it's not really an upgrade it's more a kind of radio over here and you know on demand over there so yeah yeah it's a it's a bit of a strange one but i think there's probably uh, maybe a warning sign that you know how well these things are taking off as to what, what those of us who are heavily immersed in the music and tech sphere is kind of um, maybe missing, which is that people actually don't care that much. They yeah. just want some music. <laughs> yeah. And Stephen, of course, uh, you were talking earlier about how you know audio and uh, and uh, Spotify and the like are trying to incorporate radio services into their offering. So, uh, what's your take? Do you think like they're going to uh, they're doing a good job of that? And uh, uh, maybe if they're not, you know, there there is a, an opportunity for for third parties like Pandora to come into the market and and do something to provide a better experience to users that are just looking for curation at that point. Yeah, one of the things that I thought was smart about uh, what Slacker were doing is is like having the flexible pricing and like having a a price point that might appeal to different people and like the more choice, you know. So sometimes if if there's just one cost, you know, like the nine ninety nine a month, it can be a bit intimidating. So I think Slacker were kind of smart in having like a variable pricing model and you know like making it easy for people to upgrade or downgrade, um, you know. You know, I think that's one thing that I would like to see with with some of the other services is like um, how they can have different things at different prices. Uh, yeah. to, you know, just for for flexibility for customers. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, of course I had um, uh, if if the, anybody in the audience is interested in these uh, subjects, I interviewed uh, Oleg Fomenko, who's the CEO of the company Bloom FM, on uh, last week's one to one on one to one show last week, and uh, so that they they are a company in the UK which is implementing flexible pricing models for streaming, and it's quite interesting. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you should go and check out the the episode. I think it's episode. Uh, nine of the show I, I actually used the bloom fm app uh, in the past couple of weeks and i found it really really beautiful you know visually really yeah. great application i'm not sure if it's available on uh, other platforms except ios at the no, moment it's just so, ios at the moment yeah yeah but i've like i actually thought it was a beautiful user experience and uh, I'd, I'd recommend people like it's available for a free trial at the moment to give it a bash and see what you think but yeah. i think um it's different you know, and that's what appealed to me about that. It was so different. It was interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Oh, great. Uh, um, you know, uh, then we have a few like uh, smaller bits of news, I guess, uh, which uh, we can uh, sort of rush through a little bit. Uh, so the first one is talking about the Global Repertoire Database. And so uh, this is the uh, project that is spearheaded by Deloitte and it's got all the rights holders sort of uh, involved in, in the conversation, which has announced establishing uh, London as its global headquarter and Berlin as its operations center. So uh, the GRD plans to deliver a comprehensive representation of uh, uh, the authorship and the control of musical works worldwide so in sort of layman's term it's going to make it uh, hopefully a lot easier for people to find out who owns the rights to a particular song uh, and, and uh, uh, 
uh, on the publishing front uh, uh, initially especially and how to get hold of uh, you know uh, who owns it where of course territorially and uh, uh, hopefully that will make it easier to get hold of those rights holders and clear the rights to the song instead of having to jump through a million hoops like we have to do today and, uh, and so the, this is an interesting project and the, the roadmap uh, of it is uh, it's uh, going to start building it I think uh, later this year after a, a period of, of pure research and it may become available uh, uh, from 2015 uh, but of course you know it's, it's a huge challenge because uh, they're gonna have to uh, align uh, publishers and collection societies and uh, trade organizations uh, and uh, digital services as well so it's gonna be a, a lot a lot of work for those guys uh, on this and so uh, you know do you think that the industry is mature enough to understand how important doing this is and that shouldn't really mess it up uh, at this point yeah, I think it's uh, it's actually amazing. It's great news for London that the fact that they're going to be based here. Yeah. Um, I think is it development that they're going to be doing in in Berlin? Did you say? Yeah, I think they, it's, it's, yeah they, they mentioned the operations side, so I, I understand it's yeah. probably the development side. Yeah, it's a big win for big win for the UK. Um, the whole world of publishing and rights ownership is it's a nightmare. Yeah. You know, and I've been trying. To, you know, I've been trying to you know you know understand that and comprehend some of the. You know, if you want to go back and you know find who owns what related to a track or who's responsible, who administers, uh, you know, the rights to certain parts of a track, it's it's a nightmare. So something like the the GRD is really needed, and uh, the sooner the better they can they can you know actually get building the product. You know, because as you said, they're in a research mode at the moment. It would be great for the industry and um, long overdue, but great to see London um, at the heart of it. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, I, I, I spoke to a lot of people about this and some people are really skeptical that this is going to work. But Darren, do you think that they, they will pull together and, and come through with this? I think they need to. I mean, you know, there's no question that that whole world of tracking the broader information, be it publishing or even back to stuff like metadata, it was, I think it became a real casualty through the digital age. You know, as music shifted to be online, it's kind of really suffered in that area, um, you know, as, as Stephen said, the, the you know the, the, the sort of means to navigate this at the moment is truly horrifying. Um, and equally, you know, I think with this, this just that entire world of the information around artists, you know, whether it's the you know the composers, you know, the publishers, those sorts of things, all right through to you know the details that you used to get on an album liner note type area that you don't get now, like who you know, mastered it or engineered it, all that kind of stuff really, really needs to be fixed because I think it's actually incredibly valuable data. Some is more valuable than other areas, you know, and, and I think this whole GRD kind of shows that there's obviously masses of money around the publishing that, that you know, makes great sense for that area to be fixed. But equally, I think there's, you know, we've seen the Rhapsody in the, in the States now trying to, you know, implement better metadata and liner notes around releases and stuff. I think it all points to the fact that that's a whole area that desperately needs sorting out because it feels like at some point when we shifted from physical releases to um, digital ones, we kind of chopped out about 60 or 70% of the information around the release that yeah. is, is actually incredibly valuable, you know, not just for discovery but monetization as well. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of areas there that we, uh, in our rush to go digital, kind of buggered up. So it'd be great to see them getting fixed up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and like it's, you know, th there's a lot of vested interest with, you know, with regards to publishing and people like in the longer that they can hold off before they can pay out money, like it's, you know, for all the different uh, uh, services around the world and rights owners, it's, and some someone like that, I think Cobalt are doing really interesting things with the reporting of the, you know, the administration of publishing rights, you know, like the guys at Cobalt are also leading the way in transparent, uh, real-time understanding or access to statistics for artists, you know, and I think it will take someone like Cobalt to prove that, you know, here's what we can do and here's what, here are the benefits, you know, and here's how we can improve the payment time to our, to, to, to our artists. And um, if some, like, I think Cobalt, because they've, They've such a, a great relationship with the artists that they work with, and they're trying to make what they do extremely transparent. That that will push other people to innovate faster 
because technically it's possible with all the, these APIs talking to one another, uh, it's technically possible to build. It's how we can accelerate that, you know, yeah. instead of it being a quango or a talking shop or, you know, meetings about meetings, like, let's, let's start building it. Yeah, and, and it takes companies like that to sort of push envelopes for majors that may drag, be dragging their feet a little bit when it comes to, to uh, investing in reporting tools because, of course, those are not investments that they might deem to be necessary but then when they start seeing songwriters fleeing to a publisher like cobalt they might realize that they need to invest in that kind of stuff and actually get yeah and, and if you look at some of the you know cobalt have been landing some great uh, deals lately you know some, yeah. like the nick cave one was a standout pet shop boys are going to do their new stuff through cobalt and everybody's talking to them because they're extremely interested in the kind of their kind of flexible approach to rights management yeah. uh, rights ownership and uh, the transparency of uh, how they pay how they collect and how accurate they can be. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, uh, another uh, sort of short piece of news of this week uh, was that SoundCloud announced uh, its plans to open an office in New York alongside Berlin, London, San Francisco, and Sofia uh, in Bulgaria. And uh, so, um, um, one interesting part of this announcement was that Hypebot reported, which I haven't seen anywhere else, uh, that the office will be headed by Pandora's former National Director of Strategic Partnerships, uh, Partnerships uh, Dan Gerber. Uh, so the new hire brings in a wealth of experience when it comes to dealing with brands, uh, and uh, that really comes in handy when, uh, as and when the company uh, moves uh, in a bigger way into the advertising space with the, pro part, uh, the partner pro plans uh, that they uh, sort of soft beta launched uh, earlier this year. So and New York, of course, is a hub still of the advertising community in the US. So it's a great place to set up an office if you are planning to, to go that way. And, and I don't know, guys, do you think this is a real sign that they're going to move pretty quickly and aggressively on the monet monetization front uh, through uh, the sort of ad-like experience of the partner pro plan plans? Uh, Darren? Um... I no, I, I don't think they're moving quickly, which isn't a criticism. I think yeah, they're just yeah. being very methodical of, uh, about exploring that that terrain. I mean, you, you know, the the coverage I saw. I think when when Alex Leung was kind of asked about it, he basically said, "Look, I don't know what we would be kind of monetizing this at because that's we're not even there yet. You know, we're exploring what's possible and trying to build out something from there, which I I think is is wise. You know." Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's a funny one, really. I'd kind of said to somebody else earlier in the week that while there's an argument that brands would get involved and have brand messaging with their sort of images behind the waveform and everything, I do wonder the degree to which um, that's controlled so that you don't just get kind of Snoop Dogg going off and doing a deal with some sports brand to do his own stuff on SoundCloud and effectively cutting SoundCloud out of the deal, which we've kind of seen before on Twitter where, you know, you famously, I think it was Wayne Rooney and a bunch of Nike um, advocates got caught out for shilling for the brand, but without really making it 100% clear that it was a, it was a, you know, a brand sponsored message rather than his own opinion. Yeah. Um, and Twitter, I think, has tried to crack down on that and has obviously got its own ad platform evolving. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I sympathize with SoundCloud. I mean, I've been critical of them before in terms of, you know, their need to figure out what kind of a service they are and how, you know, what they're, what they give back to, to artists and things like that. But equally, I kind of, I do sympathize with their position in that it's a tricky one to try and resolve without annoying somebody somewhere, you know, it's that sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't um, approach. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it'd be very interesting to see what they can do in that area. Um, yeah. You know, and, and just as YouTube ultimately introduced ads, I, I still think there's a sort of inevitability uh, to which SoundCloud will probably just wind up having to run fairly blunt ads. And it, it's been interesting when you look at the likes of YouTube and Twitter and who, you know, when they all started were very, very kind of like, no, we're never just going to be a traditional ad company. Facebook too, you know, always resisted that. And yet you look at them all now, you know, Facebook and Twitter are both mining keywords for targeting, all of which is exactly the same stuff that Google was doing 10 years ago, you know. So they have become very traditional ad companies. And, and I suspect that there's an inevitability about SoundCloud ultimately being in the same space, only because that's the only model that seems to really work at the moment. And, yeah. and at some point, SoundCloud's investors were going to be telling them to deliver back, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but all power to them, you know. I think they're exploring the area. They're being very honest about it. I, I mean, one thing I'd say about SoundCloud, 
knowing them and knowing the people there and things like that is that they're not deceptive. They're not, no, exactly. they're not shitty about this. They're very upfront about what they're doing. I don't think they're trying to, you know, they've always been quite an open book. And I respect that. I think that's a, a good way to operate and good luck to them. Yeah. And Stephen, I get, New, New yeah. York is a good place to, to set up. I mean, I know you, you've done a few trips, you know, and you have you have had relationships with, with brands and artists over there. So, so is it a good place to have, a, to have an office and, and have a base? Yeah, especially for the kind of ad industry. And I guess they're being very diligent in their approach to, you know, the brands. You know, so that in many ways, they've been a victim of their own success. You know, because of the, you know, the increase in, in, uh, in consumption of music on SoundCloud and the increase in users and uh, you know that again has highlighted you know show me the money aspect you know I think yeah. you know it's no secret that you know there's been you know because you know when they, they launched a new platform a while back they just the numbers shot up you know the engagement in SoundCloud and the streams so um, and I, I just think that brands will in time find a natural home there uh, and brands are kind of inserting themselves in so many things that go on in the music industry these days and the big one that like they have done a fantastic job in a not too cheesy way is you know i always go back to red bull you course, know yeah. Yeah, we talked about that been, last week actually yeah. yeah magnificent in how they insert themselves into the music conversation you know organically you know and, and it doesn't feel like you're being sold sold to yeah um, yeah but it's great to see soundcloud evolve you know like i remember they had a berlin office small team in london they've grown rapidly in san francisco now where they've got up to up to you know 20 people as far as i know and new york is a, a, a natural next step yeah absolutely and uh, in terms of service announcements uh, this week uh, the, there was an announcement that media has changed its dates for next year so uh, the uh, conference based in Cannes, uh, uh in can sorry will uh, take place between the 1st and the 4th of february 2014 and this is likely to uh, this is due uh, most po probably uh, due to uh, the fact that the grammys have also been shifted by a week uh, and that would have probably um, made it impossible for some of the us delegates to attend but it's actually uh, for me it's actually good news because it means that there's two weeks between Eurosonic and Eurosonic and Medium, so it might mean that this year I actually get to do both. But I don't know. I, you guys, that uh, think that's a good good news? No, I really want to know the number of people that did the same thing as me, which read it and went, "Amazing!" Is it moved to like June so that we can be in Cannes when the sun's <laughs> actually out? And then I, I hope. I hope. Um, um, oh, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> <been> like, <laughs> Damn it! We'll still be there in the freezing cold. <laughs> I hope nobody booked the the Carlton Street in the in the Carlton for or the the, the James the, what's it called the Sean Connery Street in the Carlton for the last week of uh, January you know a year ago because <laughs> uh, it's going to be completely useless to them and about twenty grand down the Swanee um, now. <laughs> well, I would say they deserve it if somebody did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is, it, is it twenty grand the price of two drinks in Cannes? No. Almost. almost. Um, <laughs> But yeah, if somebody if somebody did that, then uh, I have no sympathy whatsoever. I think uh, they had to as well with the fact that it clashed with the Grammys. There would have been so many. Like, can is still a massive, or me damn is still a massive deal to the United States. You yeah. know, like you can just see the how seriously they take the event, me damn, with by the amount of Americans and U.S. Uh, labels and publishers that come to me damn every year. I'm always amazed that uh, there's so many there. You know, it's yeah. unbelievable and. Uh, you know they had to it was a case of having to yeah yeah absolutely because uh, it's, it's it's it goes both ways you know the, the the u.s delegates want to meet european companies but also european companies want to meet u.s delegates so uh, without having to make the trip uh, across the pond so yeah absolutely and also uh, finally uh, the great escape kicks off uh, uh, tomorrow so the great escape is a music conference here in the uk uh, it's uh, based in brighton it's just about an hour south of london and uh, uh, it's gonna have uh, about 350 bands playing over three days and uh, uh uh, three days also of worth of conferences and so the tomorrow it's going to be uh, all about uh, so the Thursday is going to be all about uh, data and discovery uh, Friday a number of sessions on marketing and then Saturday a whole day devoted to DIY and so guys anything in particular you're excited about I know you're, and you're both going uh, either session wise or band wise for the event um, I must admit session wise uh, I've not really looked yeah. I think because this year I'm I'm going and I've just got lots of people I'm meeting and I'm sort of down there for business reasons. So um, I haven't looked at the panels, although I know that Last FM are, are doing some kind of presentation and they've got some really cool stuff with their uh, live. They're kind of, they've got a live thing that's active at the moment in their labs area, which yeah. is worth looking up if you, if you get time. 
that shows basically what people are listening to live worldwide. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And uh, it's it's horribly addictive because obviously when the Daft Punk album leaked, you just sat there going, all right, well, which ones are, you know, what tracks are people listening to most? Turned out is the Giorgio by Moroder track, which uh, is right because it's the best song on the album. Um, but, you know, they're, they're they're going to present a bunch of stuff around that, so that could be a pretty interesting one to see. Uh, right. In terms of bands, I'm entirely biased because I've got a couple of them playing down there. Yeah. So uh, Drenge are playing one night, and they're well worth seeing because they're rowdy and brilliant. Uh, but also Eliza and the Bear, who are uh, about another band I work with, who are fantastic and are currently uh, subject to quite a hot bidding war, I understand. So um, they're absolutely worth checking out if you can. But beyond that, you know what? I just love Great Escape because it's kind of like me, them, but cheaper um <laughs> just well you know i'm not i'm not having a pop at me them. it's just that it's quite rare that you get events that are frankly a little bit closer to home that just bring the whole kind of uk community into the same place whether it's label yeah. people managers or the kind of music tech people you know so whilst it's a certainly a you know much smaller event than your south buys and your mediums um if you're in the uk it's a fantastic chance to just kind of network and you know meet all these people and, and uh, see what everyone's up to. So um, I love it. It's, it's one of my favourite events of the year. Great. Great. Yeah, I, I echo what Darren said. Uh, I actually read yesterday that they've sold out of, uh, you know, uh, passes for the, you know, for the uh, for the music. So that's a great sign. I think it's the first time they've sold out um, before the event. Um, and for networking, I just think it's great. You know, like, you could literally plant yourself in a pub beside the venue and do a lot of business there for over three days and and even without setting up meetings you can organically uh just meet lots of great people um yeah. and anything that brings people together in this industry is a good thing it's an hour from london it makes a lot of sense and uh you know 300 bands in like in a square mile yeah you know, what's not to, what's not to love yeah, exactly and not as much walking as in austin that's for sure and uh, um, also there's another event happening this weekend uh, which is the music tech fest which is in london and it's free to attend so uh, i'm actually gonna probably uh, be doing both and if you uh, want to check it out uh, you can check out uh, musictechfest.org or event uh, or musictechfest.eventbrite.com to get free tickets it's a free event so uh, well worth uh, checking out as well and uh, that's all for this week uh, but guys anything that you need to plug uh, your end on projects that you're doing i know that darren you've already mentioned a couple of the bands you work with and uh, steven anything anything you're on as well uh, on the mobile roadie end we've just released our latest uh, version uh, 5.0 um which takes advantage of some of the new things that apple are you know making available things like geo fencing of content you know where you right. can unlock stuff around the venue um kind of real-time polling and analytics you know interesting things you know where you can measure the success of what you're doing with, with mobile um uh you know they're, they're the big things for us the new release Great. and um yeah looking awesome. forward to getting that into the hands of our users perfect cool and darren anything else aside from the bands uh or you good uh oh god you know what there's so much stuff going on at the That's minute. Cool. i don't know where to start <laughs> my, my my big experiment with uh with a particular artist ends this weekend um where uh yeah i might be writing a blog next week that will be taking a Hopefully, fairly interesting look at kind of analysing whether social media is is handled properly and whether we're actually totally wasting our time trying to do the friendly social marketing and should in fact just be putting more money to advertising on there. So um, keep an eye out for that on my website, mrtrick.net, uh, or just you know you find it by one means or another. Awesome. And uh, also, yeah, if you check out uh, Motive Unknown, uh, they, uh, Darren also does, does a daily digest uh, with uh, uh, a good, uh, great, actually, summary of, uh, of the week, of the daily news uh, that are happening and uh, with the, the paragraph of commentary that is always uh, worth, well worth reading. So sign up if you uh, uh, don't already. And uh, that's, that's it. Uh, thanks so much for joining me, guys. And thanks so much for listening. Uh, Digital Music Trends is available every week. Uh, we have this uh, show, which is a panel show where we chat about the news of the week. But there's also a one-to-one -one show which is also weekly uh, where I interview uh, CEOs of companies, uh, startups, uh, digital agencies on their projects and uh, sort of have one-to-one -one conversations with them on what they are doing uh, specifically. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.